Well, Merry Christmas, Rise City. Wow, what a warm welcome. Thank you, thank you. I hope and pray that um, you are experiencing joy and good things around these holidays, especially in the midst of some of the challenges that we're facing and the chaos. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this sermon series. It's been good, right? It's been good for me. Um, and my hope this morning is that I just don't mess it up. I don't want to. I don't want to wreck your Christmas. Well, I don't know. I, yeah, whatever. I don't want to wreck your Christmas. I don't want to wreck the series. But um, you know, to be honest with you, and that's one of the things I I, I want to be is honest, is that the holidays are hard for me. And you know, I I, I have a real love hate relationship with Christmas, with the holidays in general, and it's extreme highs and extreme lows and joys and pain and excitement and disappointment all wrapped up into a fun gift uh, all at the same time. Um, And that's why we've titled this uh, message today, uh, Jingle Blahs. Because the truth is that oftentimes this time of year, even though we experience incredible joy, there's just sometimes these feelings that we experience that we just don't quite feel right, do we? Something is a little bit off. And, you know, when I imagined um, the pastors, you know, the spiritual giants of our church getting together, right, when they, put, when they crafted this series, winter, walking in a winter worried land, and they came to this last message, this final installment called Jingle Blahs, I... I I have this feeling that it went a little something like this. They gathered around, right? And they thought to themselves, these spiritual giants, they thought to themselves, who do we know that represents sadness and pain? (laughs) The blahs better than anyone else. Who could share a message of sadness and loneliness, depression, despair, loss, And at the same time, not completely bum everyone out. They looked around the room, and they looked at Brandon, and they're like, well, yeah, maybe. I don't know. The next obvious choice was Pete to preach, and Pete was like, no, I removed my name from the running. (laughs) Then they looked around, they're like, well, I mean, maybe it's Pastor Mike or Pastor Robert. And then they all, like, laugh because they're like, no, those those guys are way too cheery. Those guys are way too optimistic and upbeat. No, 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 we need a real pro. (laughs) We need someone with the sadness chops that could really pull this off. And so in unison, as if the Spirit of God descended on them at the same time, they looked at each other and in unison said, Matt. (laughs) Yes, that's exactly what happened. I'm told. That's what at least the story I tell. Um, but it's okay. I want you to know that I'm good with it because I'm, I'm good with who I am. Like, I'm all right. Like, I'm okay uh, with who I am. Don't feel sorry for me. Uh, in fact, one of the, the names that my kids have given me over the last few years is they, they now call me Sad Sap. That's their name for me. And you know what? I'm okay with it, right? Because in some ways, I agree. I am becoming uh, kind of a sappy old man. And I, I don't, I, I'm okay with it because it's true. Um, and, you know, I don't know what it is, but, like, uh, you know, I, I, when we, you know, I like Hallmark movies. Anyone like Hallmark movies? Come on. I'm not a robot. Um, but I like Hallmark movies. Um, but, I, you know, one of the things about movies that really bothers me is that for some reason the dad always dies. And that just makes me so sad. Like, I, not that I want the mom to die by any means, like, of course. But, but like, I, you know, the thought of my kid's being without their dad or me being without them, you know, like it makes me sad. Or when, when Brandon tells stories last week of the Christmas offering and the impact that your generosity has made in our world and our community, it tears me up inside. Yeah, and when I see a puppy, I cry. It's not a, it's not a big deal, like, right? That's normal, right? Um, but, you know, I know that some of you men are probably judging me, right? Because you're like strong East County, San Diego men. Our drummer, Dave, by the way, just for record, he said, Matt, you look like a lumberjack this morning. And I was like, yeah, that's right. A lumberjack who cries. But, you know, I, 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 you know I, you men who think you're 
above this sort of sappiness, I want, to, I want you to know that I'm on to you. I know. The gig is up. I, I get it. Because here's, here's why. Because anger and crankiness are just repressed sad feelings. Everyone knows that. Everyone just went, mm, heck yeah. You know it. We're on to you. Next time you see your husband or your dad get cranky or angry, just go, oh, I love you too. You're so sweet. Give him a hug. Um, my goal this morning, my, my number one goal is to not bum you out days before Christmas, right? Um, because we're going to talk about the tension that exists around this time. Uh, but really, my second goal, and I think God's goal for us this morning, is that we would be lovingly and graciously confronted with the cross of Christmas this morning. That we would um, meet with Christ in such a way that, <clears throat> that it changes our perspective. It changes our lives. Because there's nothing like the cross that holds in tension what we're talking about, which is this joy and pain simultaneous. This joy and pain that we would um, not merely follow the crowd or the culture, but the cross of Christ, and that we would draw our attention to the one that we celebrate and the why behind which we celebrate. I want to read a verse, and I want to invite you to stand with me to read this verse. And I want to encourage us to read it together. Now, if you're new to church or uh, uncomfortable, don't feel pressure. You don't need to to read along with us. But, but, but if you feel comfortable and you could read along with us, I, I would love for you to join us because there's, there's some unity that happens when we read Scripture together. When we call our attention together and when we speak it out, there's power in that. And it comes from Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. So it, it'll be up there on the board for you. But read along with me. It says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for this morning. And thank you, God, for both joy and pain. Thank you, God, that they draw our attention to you if we're mindful of it. And God, would you just show yourself to be the wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace to us this morning. God, capture our hearts and our attention today. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. You can have a seat. Um, well, there's another Christmas song, traditional Christmas song, that I think holds this tension and stress of joy and sorrow really, really well. And uh, it's the song, it's the most wonderful time of the year. You know this song, right? Uh, written in 1963. Um, I like to look at it and think of it that it would be better sung as a question, right? It's the most wonderful time of the year. Like, it, like that's the way I think it should be sung. Because if you read some of the lyrics, which I want to read for you here in a second, you, you'll know why. Like, it, listen to some of this craziness. It says this, there'll be parties for hosting. Well, that sounds awful. <laughs> Who, anyone hosting parties this year? I know we're in a weird season, right? Like, you know, but I don't even like going to parties. It's stressful. Like, what do you wear? What do you bring? Who's going to be there? Who's not going to be there? Like, when can I go? When can I stay? Like, how many of those do I have to go to to not offend or hurt people? It's stressful. It's a stressful time, right? Uh, there'll be marshmallows for toasting and caroling out in the snow. That marshmallow sounds fantastic. I, I will always eat marshmallows, but we can't really do the caroling out in the snow. We don't have that here, right? <laughs> but that sounds good. That sounds fun. Listen to the next one. There'll be scary ghost stories. <laughs> what? It... I want to know you and meet you after if you tell scary ghost stories around Christmas. I got a referral for a therapist for you. No judgment. It's just, you know, you might need help. That's all. It's, we all do. But I don't know who's telling scary ghost stories, but that's concerning. Okay, listen. Now, he goes on. And tales of the glories of Christmas is long, long ago. 
<clears throat> oh, don't we love to be reminiscent? Don't we love to remember the glories of Christmas is long, long ago. I, I, we always look back. Nostalgia is this idea of looking back and remembering things as probably better than they were. Like, you know, like it's stressful. It's hard. We love to tell stories. Oh, do you remember that Christmas when we did X, Y, and Z? And we went here and we did this and we experienced these, all these fun feelings, right? But isn't Christmas and the stories of long, long ago, isn't it a mixed bag? Isn't it hard to remember sometimes? Because... When we remember, we're also reminded of love that we've lost, people we've lost, relationships we've lost, things that have changed. Some of you have lost loved ones in the last year or two, and it's a painful time. Yes, you're trying to have joy and be jolly and full of of Christmas spirit, but you're reminded very tenderly just how hard it is this time of year, aren't you? It's a mixed bag. Go on. There'll be much mistletoeing. I guess that's a verb now. You, there'll be a lot of kissing going. I, this was pre-COVID, completely pre-COVID <laughs> lyrics. But I don't know about you, but like I, I'm a hugger, but like I'm, not a ki- I'm not about to kiss everybody. Like I believe in kissing. It's not like I'm anti-kissing but much mistletoeing, just like <clears throat> randomly kissing people. I remember as a kid, vividly, like I had these memories of my aunts like, like chasing me around, trying to kiss me at Christmas. And I'm like, I don't like you or know you, uh, let alone want to kiss you. And, and like, I, it's like boundaries, people, right? Come on, like this is, I shouldn't have to kiss you. I see you twice a year. But, but I, like, I had this one aunt, I remember she had like, fake teeth, and she would pull them out, and you're like, arr, 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 arr. like, she was chasing us around, like, I'm like, that's the scary ghost stories, there you go, there it is, right there, that's what happens, um, be kind to your kids this year, you guys, please, don't make them kiss people, um, listen, and then the, the, the next one, the last one, and hearts will be glowing when loved ones are near, Ooh, well, it depends, doesn't it, which loved ones, because some loved ones are harder to be around than others, right? Right, because, because sometimes those that we love the most or we love the most cause us the most pain, don't they? Or we've caused them the most pain. So it's a mixed bag. There's tension. And, and you know, it's amazing to me that we follow and worship this Jesus who is called the Prince of Peace, yet so often in our lives we feel so unsettled all year round, but even more so around the holidays. And although I think there are many reasons for it, um, two stand out to me the most, and they're the the two ideas of stress and pain. So I think what happens around the holidays is we get into this place where we get into stress management and pain management. And we're just trying to survive, right? And so we're trying to make it through. We're trying to enjoy this time, and we're trying to make it through. for some of us, it's easier than others, but, but, it, but it becomes about stress and pain management rather than celebration, rather than experiencing the goodness of God. And if you've ever had to manage any chronic pain or stress, you know how it feels. It can be all-consuming. It can be all that you think about. It can be all that you see and experience. But God would have something better for all of us. See, we don't want to just manage stress and pain. We want, we want to experience life. But part of the reason we feel depressed or down or have the blahs around Christmas sometimes is that we, we're not okay with the way we feel. We're not okay with the mixed bag and the tension that exists. We're not okay. We don't accept it. And so it makes it very difficult for us to experience. We feel bad about feeling bad. But it's normal. And we compound our pain and our stress when we refuse to accept the way we feel. And we refuse to accept the reality of life. You know, when I meet with somebody who's hurting or, you know, somebody for counseling or coaching, sometimes they're, they're surprised when I tell them, like, of course, you're having a hard time. They're like, really? Yeah, of course. Who wouldn't be having a hard time if they were going through what you're going through, feeling what you're feeling, thinking what you're thinking? Of course you're having a hard time. And they'll look at me like, really? I, is that okay? Is that okay? Like, like, 
Sometimes people will apologize to me for the way they feel. As if I'm God or the judge of what's okay to feel or not feel. They'll say, well, what's wrong with me? And I'll say, nothing's wrong with you. You're human. And you're created in the image of God, a God who actually feels deeply. Read your Bible. God feels a lot. God feels deeply. God expresses pain, joy, sorrow. The stress and the pressure of managing everything and everyone around us is so overwhelming, so much so that we feel like we have, we feel bad for feeling bad, and then we feel like we either have to fake it or live in isolation for a month. And so that's what happens sometimes. Like, hey, I haven't seen you in a while. Yeah, it's because I've been hiding. <laughs> and some, of, some, some people aren't here right now because they're hiding. Maybe they're online instead of in person because it's just too painful to walk around with the tension, the stress, the pain. I heard a story recently of a woman who had lost her mother six years ago to cancer. And she had said that she hadn't celebrated Christmas in six years because it was her mother's favorite holiday. And I thought to myself, that's so sad, right? Because because if her mother was here to tell her, she would say, no, 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 I want you to celebrate. You know, when when we lose people we love, or or even when I'm gone, yeah, it's, yeah, you would expect people to be sad and to grieve the loss, but but to stay stuck in it forever is a terribly painful experience. And you know, she, she, go, she went on to say that she actually began to experience healing the moment she decided to begin to celebrate Christmas again. It didn't take all the pain away, but it changed her perspective. And that's the hope for us as well. You know, if we were to be honest, I think that sometimes for all of us, we have to ask this question, do we really want Jesus, the Prince of Peace? Or do we want peace apart from Jesus? Because peace through Jesus comes at a cost. Often involves pain, suffering of some kind. I want to give you three reminders, three things to help us Navigate and manage the stress and pain of the season so that we can truly enjoy and experience the Christ of Christmas. Three things. First one is this. Remember to let go. Remember to let go. Uh, James 4.1, James, the brother of Jesus, said this to the church, the people of God, believers. He said this in verse uh, 1 of chapter 4. He says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? I wonder if he was writing this during Christmas. I don't know, but it could be. Um, He he says, don't they come from your desires that battle within you? Can I give you another word for desires? Fits somewhat here. Expectations. Expectations. What if we replace that word in that verse just for a moment and said, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your expectations that battle within you? You know, unhealthy expectations are relationship killers. They'll kill your relationship with others. They'll kill your relationship with your spouse. They'll kill your relationship with God. They'll kill your relationships to experiences and seasons and holidays. Unhealthy and unreasonable expectations will kill all of that. Because, you see, the problem is is that that we are looking to people and things and experiences like Christmas to meet the deep longings of our soul. We are looking ultimately for love and joy and peace. We were created for these things and we were promised these things by God. Yet no human or human experience will provide what only God can. Spouse, perfectly well-behaved children, gifts, the perfect Christmas, these can all be a taste of love, joy, and peace. These can all point to the source of love, joy, and peace, but they will ultimately never, ever be a substitute for them. And so we put so much pressure on ourselves and others 
for this time of year to be something that it was never meant to be. The spiritual term for letting go is surrender. God's calling us to surrender, to let go. And surrendering is the exercising of our faith and trust in God to allow God to be God and to do his job, to let go of control. We have to accept not only our limitations, but the limitations of broken human people, which we all are. We must let it all go. Well, what do you mean, Matt? Like, like don't care? No, I'm not saying don't care. Well, maybe, I don't know. Maybe I am saying don't care. Maybe I'm saying don't care as much about certain things. Learn, learn to value what actually matters and what doesn't matter is, is, is wisdom, right? If you cared every, about everything all the time, you'd be exhausted and burned out. Learn what is your business, what is God's business, what is other people's business will give you freedom to not have to do things that you're not responsible for. We have to learn to let go. Learn to say no to some things. Learn to say no to parties. Learn to say no to relatives and in-laws and things that, that, that you may have to put boundaries around at times. Say no to finding that perfect gift or overspending so that you can make your kids happy. I fall into that too. Like, I want my kids to be happy. But to what extent? I have to live within limitations. Letting go is what faith demands of us. It's what God calls us to. We let go because God can't be God if we are in control of everything. We have to let go. We have to let go of our pride, our self-centeredness, our greed, our expectations. All of it has to go and be submitted and surrendered to the cross, to Jesus. Otherwise, we'll cause ourselves more suffering unnecessarily. If you're going to carry any expectations around this time of year and even throughout your year, do so only to yourself to be more loving. Romans 13.8 says it perfectly. Paul says this, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. What, what if we became just more loving and gracious? What if it was the greatest, which it is, the greatest gift we could give each other was just more grace, more love, more peace? But we can't give what we haven't received. So what if we gave more love? What if we became more loving? How different would our holidays be? Would our lives be? Would our experiences and relationships be like? Oh, if I could turn back time, it's one thing I would give more of, just love, love. The second thing is this, remember that seasons don't last forever. Now, the most obvious violations of this are um, playing Christmas music before Thanksgiving or even on Thanksgiving (laughs) or keeping your tree up until February. You know who you are. We've all done it at least once, except you really type A people, never done it. You've never, if you've never had your tree up till February, I don't know, at least once, come on, you're too organized. Um, you must have storage and places for things. Um, but those are violations, right? You know, like, let it go. The season's over. Seasons were meant to come and go, unless you live in San Diego. Um, Ecclesiastes, uh, Solomon says this in Ecclesiastes 3, verses 1 through 4. Listen to what he says. He says, there's a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a a time to dance. You know, some of you are mourning when it's time to be dancing again. And others of you are dancing 
And people are looking around at you like, what in the world is wrong with her? She should be mourning right now. It's important to understand what season we're in, right? And we're not all in the same season. That's what makes relationships so hard. We're not always all in the same seasons of life and experience. But there's a time for everything under heaven. And we add so much more suffering and pain to our lives when we refuse to accept the season that we're in or the truth and the reality of life, that life, even life with Jesus, is hard. That life, even following Jesus, is full of despair and hurt and rejection, depression, even loss. This is discipleship in a broken world. This is, a, this is discipleship that doesn't just stop at following a Jesus in a manger but follows a Jesus who lived a perfect life, died on the cross, and was buried and rose again. This is discipleship in a world where we follow a Savior that was broken, that gave his very life, that suffered and died, and we are called to that same path. Why are we so surprised by the trials of life? Isn't this part of what we signed up for when we said we'd follow you, Jesus, wherever? Why are we shocked when pain and loss show up? We serve and follow a Jesus that experienced rejection and pain, loss, and death. You know, I'm not here to tell you what season of life you're in, but just to remind you that life has seasons, and all seasons, whether we call them good or bad, don't last forever. All seasons are important and are necessary. All seasons are important and necessary. And there's no celebration of love without loss or life without death. Seasons are part of God's plan. And his plan is good, even when we don't label it as good. I love the words of Isaiah in Isaiah 43, verses 18 and 19, spoken by the prophet Isaiah to the people of God in, in, that were exiles in captivity. I think it applies to us in so many ways, but, but listen to what he says. He says, forget about what's happened. Forget about what's happened. Forget doesn't mean live in denial that it happened. It just, it, it literally means don't continue to recall what's happened to you. Don't continue to dig it up if it's been buried and dead. Don't dig it up again and remind yourself of your failures and your pain. And your... That's what shame does to us is, is a constant reminder of, of how we failed. He says, don't do that. Forget about what's happened. Not forget about the people, but forget about the hurt maybe. Forget about the pain, meaning let it go. It's not to live in denial about it, like I said, but to let it go. He says this, don't keep going over old history. Woo! If that's not a word from God for all of us, I don't know what is. Don't keep going over old history. Now, as somebody who does counseling and, and helps people walk through life of healing, this doesn't mean that you don't work through it. You, you have to process your pain. You have to process your hurts and all of these things, so you can let it go, so you can move on and experience the life and the purpose and the passion that God has for you. It's a process. But, but, but we have to be willing to, to let go and to stop holding on to old things. Old things that we, the pain already happened, but we're hurting and re-injuring ourselves by going over it and over and over it again and again and again. We have to let it go. Or it will keep us stuck. That's why I'm doing that class, Unstuck Life, because we're going to talk about how do we let it go. Look what he says. He says, be alert and be present. He's saying, wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Be present. Be in the moment. Part of what I do is like, how do, how do you let go of the pain of the past or the fear of the future to be present in the moment because this moment is the only moment you can do life, relationships, faith, 
anything good is happening now in this moment. It's not happening in what's happening tomorrow. You can't control tomorrow. You can't control what happened in the past. All you can be is awake and alert and present in this present moment. And listen to what he says. This is so powerfully important. Listen to the word of God to his people. I'm about to do something brand new. I'm going to do something brand new. It, listen, he says, it's bursting out. Don't you see it? They couldn't see it because they were so stuck in the past. They couldn't see the good and new work that God wanted to do. That's hope and healing in Jesus' name, isn't it? That's what God is calling us to. That's the life that God has given us. He says, there it is. I'm making a road through the desert, rivers in the badlands. You think you're walking through the desert now, but wait and see. I've got something new on the horizon for you. But if you keep digging up the old stuff and just holding on to it and protecting it as if it were your life, you'll never experience the goodness that I have for you. I know this time is hard for you. I know this pain is difficult. I know this weight is heavy. But wake up. See the new thing. Receive it. The promise. See, we'll miss the new thing if we're stuck reliving the old thing. We're invited by God to turn our pain into our purpose and greater joy. That's what, that's what the Bible said about Jesus, who for the joy set before him endured the cross for the glory of God and for our benefit. Joy resulting from pain. See, God's always up to something new and good, and it's a reminder to us to breathe and to remember that this too shall pass. This too shall pass when the time is right. See, time doesn't heal all wounds, but redemptive time does. Time that, in, that is involved with God heals all wounds. Working through it with God heals all wounds. Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 3.11, he said this. He said this. God will make everything beautiful in its time. That's a promise we can hold on to. No matter where you're at, no matter what you're going through, God will make everything beautiful in its time. The last one is this. Remember who and why we celebrate. This one might be the most important because I think it, it wraps them all together together. Um, but celebrating who Jesus is and what he's done for us on our behalf puts him at the center of our lives, not ourselves or our kids or others. It puts him at the center, right? Because praise and celebration of who God is doesn't fix all of our blahs. It doesn't fix all of our pain. It doesn't fix all of our problems. But what it does do is it fixes our perspective. It's our mind and it gets our hearts off of ourselves and on the source of life. So we have to remember who we celebrate and why. Christmas has become so confusing, hasn't it? Uh, it's hard. It really is. It's like we all decided to throw Jesus this really incredible party for his birthday, right? And, and, and you know, with his games and, and uh, gifts and great food and all the people, you know, all the fun. And then we all looked around the room and we were like, hey, where's Jesus? Who, no, you didn't invite him? I thought you were going to invite him. No, you didn't invite I thought you were sending out invitations. No, no, one's, no one invited Jesus to the birthday party, his birthday party. And you're like, well, I thought you talked to him. No, I haven't talked to him since Thanksgiving. Now, I don't... We're all looking around because we can't find Jesus at Christmas. We gather to celebrate Jesus, not our family. We don't worship our families. We don't worship our kids. We don't worship our consumerism. We don't worship all, any of these things. We don't worship a season. We gather to worship and celebrate Jesus to express thankfulness to God for those things, yes, uh, but never to forget why the why behind Christmas. Peace and joy are found in him, not in perfect circumstances, but despite imperfect circumstances. 
peace is found. And just as important as to the why is the who, call us back to our first verse that we read together. Isaiah 9, 6, for to us a child is born, son is given, and his name shall be Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Isn't he those things? He's the Wonderful Counselor. He's the one who gives us wisdom to help us resolve our pain. He's the one who is with us. We're not alone. He's the mighty God, the only one who has the authority and the strength to save and to secure us, to heal and to redeem us. He's the everlasting father. He's the one who won't leave. He's the one who would never leave us nor forsake us. And 1 John says, oh, what love the father has lavished on us that we would be called children of God. That's the love of the father. And he's the prince of peace. Celebrate the God of comfort, Emmanuel, God with us. God with us in our pain, in our joys, in our disappointments, in our doubts, in our fears, in our fun, in our celebration. God with us. The one who brings peace. We celebrate to remind ourselves that this is not our home. This celebration pales in comparison to the celebration we will have one day. Oh, the joy coming for those who love and follow Jesus, not just like him, the one who suffered pain and death to love and to gift us a better life here and for all eternity. If it's not all about Jesus, then we've missed the point of Christmas and we've missed the point of our very existence. So we enjoy it all, the pain and the sorrow, the fun, the laughter, the mourning, and the dancing as we celebrate the Prince of Peace. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this moment to be reminded of your grace and mercy, which we cannot manufacture of our own. Oh, Lord, we look for peace. We try to fake it. We try to create it. We try to to secure it apart from you. And we're left feeling empty and lost, Lord. Jesus, you are it. You're the one, the only one who brings peace, the only one who brings new hope, and new life, God. I pray for any and all those who are discouraged this morning, who are in a time of mourning and loss, God, that they would embrace this season and receive peace. And I pray for those that are in in, in seasons of dancing and laughter and joy, that they too would receive this season as a blessing and receive your peace. God, help us to make a lot of you, not just your birth, the cross of Christmas. We love you. We celebrate you now. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.